Um, good afternoon, and let's uh, let's start with some announcements. Homework one is on Canvas, and uh, hello. Let's get started, please. So, homework one is on Canvas, and uh, it's due in two weeks. Uh, you should have access to it. Uh, it's all about decision trees, and I'm hoping by the end of today's lecture, you should have we would have completed all the uh, the lecture part of what's necessary for the homework. Uh, you'll be implementing the ID3 algorithm, uh, playing with some variants of that and such things. Uh, I encourage you to start as soon as possible because uh, historically, this is the homework that takes the longest. Not because it's necessarily the hardest, but this is the first time you'll run into weird issues like something's wrong with the CAD machine or um, that cross-validation is taking, you'll be implementing cross-validation. And you'll find that cross-validation is taking like, you project it to take 40 days before it completes. It should not. So, you know, you may have to kind of work on your code to uh, make it, uh, you know, finish on time. I can assure you that this homework can be done in two weeks. Um, so it, it, it's, it, 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 it is doable, but I encourage you to start soon because in case you run into trouble, you can use the office hours and maybe even a bit of the class time to discuss those issues. And also Canvas. Um, there was a couple of people uh, requested that uh, I use Piazza. I'm still kind of figuring out how to do it, having never done it in the last 11 years now. So um, I'll keep you posted. But for homework one, let's use Canvas and chances are going ahead, we might swap over to Piazza. Um, the class is full. I know that uh, some of you are still waiting for permission code. Um, unfortunately, I have to uh, draw the line somewhere. Um, the class, the, so the, the officially the class registration is closed. Uh, some of you got permission codes this morning. That's the last batch. Um, almost all of you who got permission codes and have already registered. I have added you to Canvas and given you extra time for homework zero, which you did not get time to do before. If you did not get that extra time, or if you don't see homework zero on Canvas, send us a message on Canvas and we'll make sure that you have that. Any questions about um, any of these things? If not, um, I've got a full hour and 20 minutes of lecture for you. So let's dive right in. In the last class, we were looking at decision trees. And uh, in particular, we looked at this question of uh, what kinds of things decision trees represent, what they are. Uh, the short version is decision trees are essentially this hierarchical data structure where you uh, every node is asking a question about a feature or maybe some collection of features even and different answers take you down different parts of the tree and you keep asking questions till you basically end at a leaf and the leaf is the label um it's a it can be seen as like a way of re compactly representing large amounts of data uh, there was an interesting comment that came up after class uh, on tuesday where um, I forgot to ask the name of the person, but they mentioned that uh, it's not going to give any generalization. It's just going to memorize the data. Essentially, the uh, decision tree, if you give the decision tree, uh, if you construct a decision tree for some data set, it's going to memorize the whole thing. Um, the only generalization that may come so far is because of the way in which you may have designed some features. Maybe you picked some features that abstract things out in some clever ways. We'll come to that question later. Uh, and then we jumped into this algorithm called ID3, which is a greedy heuristic for constructing decision trees. Uh, the, let, so today we are gonna continue that the ID3 algorithm. We're gonna see it at least one or two different times in different perspectives. And then uh, I'll talk about some variants. Uh, just to remind you, we were working with this data set uh, that's the, called the tennis data set, where every row in this table represents one day of observations 
Uh, so you have four features, outlook, I think this is temperature, humidity, and wind. And for different values of these features, um, the, whoever collected this data set decides to play tennis or not to. And that's a plus or a minus. So this is play tennis and this is not play tennis. And our goal is to construct a decision tree that looks something like this. Now, the heart of the ID3 algorithm is um, this question of, let's forget about constructing the entire tree because that, like any sort of a tree algorithm, if you are familiar with, if you've seen these before, any tree algorithm invariably ends up uh, touching upon recursion because every subtree of a tree is also a tree. So let's not worry about the entire tree. Let's just worry about one question, which is first we need to decide what attribute goes on the root. And in this case, suppose some oracle comes and tells you the best feature to the best question to ask first is what is the outlook? Let's say that you know there's some some magic wand that gets waved and tells you that you should check outlook first. If you know what's the best feature, what attribute goes at the top of the tree, the next thing to do is to decide what to do for every value that that attribute takes. Put these two together, essentially you get the ID3 algorithm. Now, the uh, to kind of give away the punchline, what to do for each value is to realize that the subtree here represents a partition of the data where outlook is sunny. So it's only those rows where the outlook is sunny, these two, these two, and this one. That those five rows look like the full data. It's a data set, right? The data set, we need to construct a tree, this tree here. We, do, we need an algorithm to construct a tree. Well, we have one. It takes an algorithm that takes a data set and a collection of remaining features to construct a tree. That's the ID3 algorithm, so we'll make a recursive call. Um, I kind of went through this entire algorithm uh, at the end of the last lecture. I want to go over it again, just so that we are all on the same page. Was there a question? Uh, so it's other than that big idea of you know pick find the root and then decide what to do for each uh, um, child case, uh, each uh, value that the root attribute takes. There are a few edge cases to handle, and uh, this algorithm here kind of talks about some of those edge cases. In your homeworks, you may run into some others also. I'm not saying you will, you may run into them either now or maybe for your project. Um, and you know the, you can deal with that uh, as you go along. But the first edge case is, suppose all your data points have exactly the same label. So imagine that every row here had a label plus. You really don't need to do all that extra work of constructing a tree and all that. If every example is a plus, then just say plus. There's no reason to kind of doubt the data there. So if all examples have the same label, you create a leaf node with that label and you're done. You just return that row. Otherwise, these two steps together are deciding, are, are, are finding what's the root attribute at the top of the tree. We find the attribute that best classifies the data. Once you have that attribute, we need to consider every possible value that that attribute could take. So Outlook could take three values, so we have three branches. So for every possible value, um, we have a new branch. And then we need to consider the subset of the data where uh, all the, the, the where that particular feature, A, takes the value V. So let's call that SV. SV is a collection of examples. And if it turns out that that subset is empty, so there are no examples where a feature takes the value, uh, where the, for example, where Outlook, imagine there was no example where Outlook was overcast. We don't have any evidence of what to do. If the Outlook is never overcast in the data, in this case, we do have a couple of them. If the Outlook is never overcast in the data, we have no way of deciding whether we, the label should be plus or minus. We need to kind of come up with a good default. A reasonable default is to find the most common label in the entire data that we have, because that's in some sense the best guess. 
Why? Because it can help you generalize um, when this tree is eventually used. So you never leave any feature uh, without, you, you, you know, you never consider, uh, you, you don't ignore the feature because it doesn't occur in the data. So if there is no uh, outlook uh, equals overcast, you don't say, oh, it didn't occur in my 16 examples. Um, it's never going to happen again in the future. You need to have some, you need to give the tree something to do. That's the other edge case, right? Where you have uh, when SV is empty. Okay, so now we are in the case where um, we have some subset of examples, which is non-empty. We are in this else side of things. We have a non-empty set of examples for which we need to construct a tree. We have a set of examples for which we need to construct a tree. We need an algorithm that can take a collection of examples and some features and produce a tree. Luckily, we have we just we have exactly what we wanted. This algorithm here, ID3, can take a data set and some features and pr produce a tree. So we just make a recursive call. This is just calling this thing again, but not for the entire data set, but for the subset of examples where this attribute takes a certain value. And uh, we repeat. And at the end, I'll come to you in a minute. At the end, we are, you know, once we have covered every possible value of this attribute, we are done. We just return the root node and we, recursively we would have built the whole tree. Uh, there's a question. Yes. So, ah, so you, this is the, so you have a question about that thing here. So, That's an excellent question. And in fact, that's going to occupy us for the next 20 minutes. Um, that's, that, that's a good segue into what I want to do next. But are there other questions that don't involve uh, this definition of best? But I do want you to kind of think about what would it mean for a feature to be the best? And we'll talk about that, but you know, start thinking about that already. Other questions? Yes. For uh, between the quality slide and countries, how do you decide? Is between the what I mean is get into the game, like decide the, the buckets? Like, oh, I love that question. Things. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. This is fantastic. So, um, the question is um, with continuous values, I mentioned in the last lecture, if your feature is continuous, you need to somehow discretize it. You need to put them into buckets. So the question is, how do you know what those buckets are? There are a few heuristics you can use. Um, one heuristic is uh, not really a heuristic, but let's say that you have an expert who tells you, break it down here. Um, those are hard to find. But let's say that we have this feature. I'm going to just call this F. F is some feature. It can take any value on this line. And we need to decide, and there are some data points. I'm going to use, uh, there's an example where that feature takes that value. There's another example where it takes that value and so on. Let's say a few more here. So we have seven examples of this feature only. What, I, what I've done here is I've plotted the only that one feature. So there may be other features which are not being shown here. So now the question is, how do you bucket um, these points. So imagine that uh, in source seven, we have something else like this. So we have, okay, how do you bucket these points? Any ideas? So let's give these names. Any ideas on what would be good ways to bucket uh, these points? Yes. Okay, let's say I tell you that. Let's say I want three buckets. Where would you put them? You could split them evenly, right? You could do evenly by, uh, I, I want to do three here, three here, and three there, or I could take this entire range and split it into three, and then wherever things fall, that's what it is. That's another option. Um, another option is to do some sort of, yes. Was there, a, did you want to say something? No, okay, no, oh, yes.
So you are essentially using domain knowledge to partition the point. Let's say that you don't have domain knowledge. Let's say that you are just given numbers in a CSV file, like you will be repeatedly given in your homeworks. Yes. That's another idea. You can run some sort of clustering algorithm. Maybe what will happen is it will put uh, these two things in one bucket and maybe these three and this one. Maybe, right? So that's another idea. So you could do uh, K-means. Now, notice that I'm giving you answers which are not, none of which are really saying this is the best thing to do. These are all heuristics. Even the use of domain knowledge is a heuristic thing because you know at some point you have to decide 13.7 is this side, 13.71 is that side. You, you make some sort of threshold. Another sort of a useful heuristic, which I find is pretty helpful, uh, is to take advantage of the fact that these are not just points that are on the line. So oh, just for the uh, sake of it, I'm going to put one more point here for J. So these are not just points on a line. They come with labels. We have labeled examples, right? Every point here came with a label. So maybe this is a plus, a plus. So let's say we have this. A natural sort of a, a strategy is there is no reason or there is nothing in the data that tells me I need to split C and D apart. Why? Right? Because both of them are plus. But D and E, maybe I do want to split them apart so I can put a partition here between when the label changes sign. Similarly, I could put a partition here, I could put a partition here. Even though these two are so far apart, this feature gives me no information to tell me that they should be in different buckets because both of them are a minus. So that's it, I'm done. Another heuristic. Is this good? Sometimes um, some uh, some decision tree packages use this as a default heuristic for continuous features. Question, other questions about ID3 or features or any of these things. If there are no questions, Oh, you have a question, yes. Which one? Uh, sorry, this, um... this heuristic of, oh. uh, you know what will happen with other sort of learning algorithms? Um, we'll be doing the opposite kind of transformation. When we have discrete features, we'll be making them continuous because all the most other learning algorithms operate in real number space. So we are actually better off with uh, uh, real numbers rather even in even booleans get converted into zero comma one and treat them as the number zero or the number one and if you have k categories you have different heuristics for converting them uh, we talked about one of those where uh, the one hot encoding uh, is a is a way of converting discrete categories into continuous numbers so it's usually the other side this is um, this sort of stuff happens with decision tree, but almost, uh, I think all the other algorithms we've seen in this class require the opposite side. Okay, um, let's now get into the, the most difficult question, which is uh, the, the question that, uh, oh, there's, there was a comment on um, Slack saying clustering, um, I should, somehow figure out a way to keep Slack in my line of sight. Not Slack, sorry, chat in my line of sight. Uh, clustering was another option that was uh, mentioned also in the class. So the question uh, that really is unresolved is if, if you had to implement this algorithm, everything is essentially solved except for this definition of best. So that's what we're gonna worry about right now. What does it mean for a particular feature to be the best. This kind of connects to what is it, what is the best, uh, what kinds of trees are better and what kinds of trees are not. 
the uh, the choice that the ID3 algorithm makes is it expresses a preference for trees being smaller. By smaller, I mean lower height. Why is that? Uh, the intuition is: imagine you have a big data set with, like, let's say we have you have a data set with a million examples, and let's say there are uh, thousands of features, and it just so happens through some incredible luck, you found a tree with just one node that perfectly separates the data into plus and minus, or perfectly separates, the, you know, agrees with the data. Even though there are a thousand features, even though there are a million examples, this one feature perfectly classifies the data as positive or negative. Wouldn't it be a ridiculously ridiculous uh, surprise if I told you this was an accident? Um, it, it is highly unlikely for a small tree to be consistent with the data set and for it to be an accident. You can easily think of complicated, long, big trees that fit every kind of all the noise in the data. So smaller trees being consistent with the data is less likely to be an accident. As a result, it's more likely to be to have discovered some underlying pattern in the data. That's the intuition that uh, uh, this heuristic tries to sort of capture. This intuition uh, it, it sometimes goes with the name Occam's razor. Simpler explanations, if they fit the data, are more likely to be true. We will spend a lot of time somewhere in the middle of the semester talking about Occam's razor. Um, and we'll even uh, encounter a few theorems that are called the Occam's razor where we will prove this thing in like a little bit more formal sense. But for now, let's say that uh, the intuition is, our goal is to find the smallest possible tree, which is great. Unfortunately, finding the smallest possible tree that's also consistent with data is NP hard. Yes. <laughs> Some sort of noise. Yeah, some noise. Even then, it's uh, how much does what change? The NP hardness or the fact that it's good? Uh, uh, oh, um, that's what we're going to do. We will essentially, what we are doing now is a greedy heuristic that almost does the right job. Um, I'll get to you in a minute. One other thing was uh, with respect to as small as possible. Uh, I think the intuition, the idea still holds. A, a smaller tree fitting most of the data is less likely to be an accident. So imagine I have a tree with just one or two nodes, um, one root and just that, that fits 99% of a million uh, example data. The remaining 1% of the data that I need to fit the only way I can fit it is if the tree is allowed to grow to a few hundred nodes deep. I would much rather, it, it, it's going to be an incredible surprise if uh, you told me that the one node thing was an, just purely accident. Because how could it be that 99% of a million examples was perfectly classified using such a simple explanation? Um, it, it could, there, this is essentially a statement about nature. Nature is not complicated. That's the intuition here. Question from the back. Did you have a question? Okay. Um, so it turns out that finding the minimal, the absolute smallest tree that fits the data set is NP hard. So uh, those of you who don't have a CS background, NP hard just means don't do it. <laughs> um, it's computationally expensive. Um, so then we need to somehow find some sort of an approximation. Um, the ID3 heuristic is a recursive algorithm um, that is uh, that essentially is the approximation. It tries to, it, 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 the, the, the choice of the best tree is decided by this, uh, is defined by this goal of finding a smaller tree, but it does not guarantee that it will find the smallest tree. So the only decision that 
the IT algorithm needs to make is really which feature to pick, put at the top. And that's what, uh, uh, that, that, that's really the, the place where the heuristic, um, you know, makes its uh, preference known. So to understand this heuristic, let's look at an example. Imagine that you have a data set with uh, 200 examples. There are only two features, but there are 200 examples. Uh, there are two features A and B, both of them are Boolean. And you have uh, A equals zero and B equals zero. There are 50 such examples. When A is zero and B is one, essentially the same example is repeated 50 times. Um, and A zero one is 50 times. One zero never seems to occur in the data and one one happens a hundred times. And the only time this, uh, uh, this data set takes a positive value is when both A and B are one. So quick guess, what's this function here? It's an and. If A is one and B is one, the label plus. By the way, I'm making an implicit assumption here also, uh, sometimes in the homework, sometimes in your exams, and also you'll see this in papers, that true is equal to one equals plus, and false equals zero equals minus, and sometimes, irritatingly, false equals minus one. Uh, it's either these two or these two. There's some sort of a, you know, we just assume that when minus one is just the false side of things, and it's an it's often an unstated assumption. Okay, so let's say we have this. Um, we have two features here, right? We can either split on an A or split on a B. Which feature should we split on first? Let's uh, rather than you answering the question, uh, let me kind of walk, consider both options. The convenient thing about having two features is you can try both. So if you split on A and just use this data set, whenever A is one, this data, whenever A is one, the label's plus. When A is zero, the label's minus because we never see this row. So when A is one, you have a label plus. When A is zero, the label's minus, we are done. With just one split, we get uh, partitions. We are able to partition the data into subsets that are are pure in terms of their label, right? On the other hand, if I split on a B, if B is zero, which is this one here, because this doesn't occur at all. If B is zero, then the labels are minus. But if B is a one, we still have to choose because you can have both plus and a minus. So we still have to look at an A. If B is a one, then, then we check A and if A is one, then the labels plus. If A is uh, zero, the labels minus. So before we go ahead, which of these would be a better tree if this is all the data you have? Yes. Uh, this one, why? Aha. Uh -huh. well, so, okay, that's a, this is an interesting chart. The argument, I'm going to repeat it for the sake of the Zoom audience. The answer is uh, the, the suggestion from the class was this is a better tree because in the first tree, we are never considering this row here. And there is no uh, way that the second tree is going to be right. Counter, counter argument or maybe an argument in support. Um, well, when you think of this, you have no examples. So... That's right. That's another argument, which is I have no way of knowing this does not exist. Right? This does not exist because um, if I remove my pen from here, the furry drawing will go away. Yeah. Um, if uh, that particular row does not exist, which means that there is no evidence. From the data for me to know that this is this function is an and the reason you know this function is an and is because i showed you that row even though there are there is literally no evidence because there are zero examples given only the data and no other uh, evidence or no other prior assumptions do you want to revisit your answer at the back and there's only one other choice here um, so, given only the evidence and nothing else, we might prefer choosing 
splitting on A. There's another answer. There's another uh, sort of a reason for to think about this. Now, instead of 50, 50, 0, and 100, imagine you have 50 million, 50 million, 0, and 100 million. So we have 200 million examples. We have never, not once, have we seen one zero. So it's quite possible. Maybe the true function is an and, but it's quite possible that even in the future, we'll never see one zero. It's such a rare occurrence, we might never see it. And even if it does, the benefit that we get of having a smaller tree uh, in terms of this sort of a Occam's razor style argument far outweighs the risk of overfitting a data set by constructing a bigger tree. So it, for that reason, for that's a slightly different argument. For that argument, it's better to split on A again. You seemed a little perturbed when I said this. Well, I just have a question. You're saying that the second one would be overfitting to the data set, but I think wouldn't the, the first one also be to be the, these are the same functions. They are identical functions, but yeah. it might be overfitting in the sense that the second one actually, these are two different Boolean functions. This is a function A and B, and this is the function just A. These are two different Boolean functions, and maybe this function is not, there's no evidence for that function. That's really what I mean. Okay, so this is fine. Yes. Yes. Uh, we will encounter, come to the mathematical reason for that when we talk about learning theory, where as the number of examples grows, it is more surprising to find a small explanation that's correct. And so it's probably right. Right now, I'm just saying that in sort of a hand wavy way. And when we talk about pack learning, this is exactly what it uh, sort of formalizes. Yes. What does least mean and what does robust mean? Uh, the least variation in example. I think you have uh, something like the right intuition. But I want to come back to that after we talk about the information gain heuristic because it's not exactly that. But it keep thinking along those lines. So. so let's not change the game a little bit. Now here I had three ex zero examples, but instead, what if I have three examples for uh, thing? So now the question is, which attribute should I choose? I could do one of two things. I could split on B. I'll get the three that I had before. Well, I could split on A. Unfortunately, the trees have the same shape. Question for you is, these two trees look structurally similar. Which attribute would you split on? Yes. Why? Because you have more examples where A is your trees. Something like that? So I just put in the number of examples. Yes. Then, okay, let's now, let's, uh, yes, yeah, so you are introducing extra information about which examples are more important than others. In other words, even though I have only three examples, each example might have a weight of a hundred million. Right. For now, let's pretend all examples are equally important. What you're describing is a scenario called cost sensitive learning, where every example comes with a certain weight. And some examples that have a higher weight are more crucial. There we have to change our heuristic a little bit. It turns out that, and I'll leave this as an exercise for later, turns out that uh, we don't have to introduce too much of a change from what we will be doing next if we had those weights. Um, so the uh, I want to go back to that uh, the point about uh, the numbers here because there's a reason why I made a slide with that. So in both cases, the trees are structurally similar. They are basically structurally identical except for the labels. But 
in if I split on a B first for 150 examples out of almost 200, so basically almost three fourths of the examples, you still have some uncertainty left. You still haven't, you still can't make a decision on what the label should be because for a bulk of the examples, the, uh, un, the you're essentially pushing the uncertainty down the tree, which means that you may end up making more and more splits, which means you may end up uh, constructing a rather deep tree. Whereas for here, for the, in this case, you have essentially eliminated all uncertainty for half the examples. And even in the half that's left, it's almost always going to go down this path. But the more important point is we have, we have essentially, in this case, we have eliminated uncertainty only for one fourth of the examples. And in this case, we have eliminated uncertainty for half the examples through advantage A. Because if we do that, then there'll be fewer examples left for us to make decisions on. So there'll be fewer possible partitions that can happen in, you know, down in the tree, which means we'll get smaller trees. Questions about this intuition, because that's really what we're going to essentially formalize a little bit. That most polarizes the data. Um, almost. Almost. Uh, essentially, the uh, information gain heuristic does something like that. Um, yes. No, we will not. We will still be. So once we construct, the, remember what the IDC algorithm does. All we need to do is decide are we splitting on A or are we splitting on B? After splitting on A, we construct this tree independently and this tree independently. The this subtree is going to be constructed with all examples where A is one. So essentially, these 103 examples will then be thrown back into the ID3 algorithm and say, now use a different feature to split. So you keep recursively going down that way. Yeah. Yes. No, we will be picking one feature, right? That's a design choice. This is a design choice that uh, you have to think about. What one version of that? Uh, so the question is, if you have lots of features, do I need to keep building the tree? Till every example is, you know, finds a, you know, some place in the leaf, or can I decide to stop constructing the tree at some depth because most of the examples are correctly classified? Everything that comes below is going to be like a little bit of noise. Um, the first point there is yes, longer, bigger trees will end up fitting the noise in the data. Maybe these three examples are actually noise, and maybe we should not even have done that. Uh, construct that tree. So that's one thing, comment. The second comment is uh, a very useful heuristic. And this is a heuristic that is necessary that we are going to use for helping with generalization for decision trees is to construct what are called uh, uh, decision sums or decision, I don't know what they are called, depth limited decision trees, where you decide upfront, my tree is not going to be more than six deep. And or 14 deep or 45 deep or whatever, pick a number. And you stop constructing the tree there and just put the label. Now, the depth limited trees are especially interesting because it's one of the questions in your homework. Yes. That's exactly it. You just take the most common label among the examples that are left behind. We'll talk about that in when once we uh, get to the variance of decision trees. Okay, so let's kind of revisit uh, the idea. The goal is to pick a root node and our, uh, the intuition we want our algorithm to capture or our heuristic to capture is we want our trees to be as small as possible. The place where we can, this, uh, the ID3 algorithm can inject this information is by deciding which feature to split on at the root. The example that I just showed hopefully kind of gives you the idea that uh, 
the best feature to split on is the one that leaves the the partitioned data i'm going to erase all of this leaves the partition data on this side or this side as pure as possible in terms of the label it's really all about the label so here the um, this is 100 percent pure because it's just label minus this is almost all plus that is preferred to this where this is 100 percent pure that but this is not so that's the intuition and this way we uh, we get very quickly to leaf nodes there are multiple different kinds of heuristics where we can use and the most popular one is the information gain heuristic that uh, Quinlan introduced. The information gain heuristic builds on the notion of entropy. A quick show of hands, how many people have seen entropy before? Small number, so it's good that I have this material. Uh, so the the notion of entropy comes from uh, Claude Shannon. I mean, it, it comes from physics originally, but in the context of uh, in the computation, in the context of information, it comes from Claude Shannon. And uh, I'm I, I'm going to present a certain a view of this that is more tightly tied to decision trees and information gain. But uh, the, if you're interested in all of this, I strongly recommend uh, looking up the subject of information theory. It's such a cool field. Um, in the 1950s, uh, it was like what machine learning is today. Any problem you have in the world, try to use information theory to solve it. That's how it works. Um, anyway, uh, the, the digression aside, entropy, you can think of it as uh, impurity or disorder of a set of examples. For now, we are only considering a set of examples with respect to a binary classification task is simply defined as um, if the, the letter H is almost universally always used for entropy. I actually don't know why. Imagine that you have a collection of examples where the fraction of positive examples is P, P plus and the fraction of negative examples is P minus. Entropy is simply defined as P, the minus the negative of P plus log P plus to the base two minus P minus log P minus. So this, this is just an equation. Let's know if it's not super interesting to just see the math. Um, let's uh, um, be, it's better to think of what it means uh, more intuitively. But just for the sake of uh, completion, if you have a discrete probability distribution with k possible values, with probabilities P1 through PK, its entropy, the entropy of this distribution is simply the sum over all the uh, the support, so uh, i goes from 1 to k of pi log pi to the base 2. Entropy, for reasons that are historical, always uses base 2. There's a minus here. It's important to not make sure that the minus is not forgotten. Um, let's maybe think about what this means, going back to the binary class, binary thing. Suppose, yes. What is, what is the the proportion of positive examples, the proportion of negative examples. So imagine that all examples are positive. If all examples are positive, then P plus equals one and P minus equals zero. I can plug it into this expression and I get minus one times log one minus zero log zero um, for reasons for now just just take it as a given that zero log zero is zero. Um, you you can think about why that's the case afterwards. That and log one is zero, so the whole thing becomes zero. So if all the examples are plus, the entropy is zero. If all the examples are minus, we just get the exact opposite thing. Entropy is still zero. If half exactly half the examples are uh, plus and half the examples are minus, so you get half log half to the base 2 minus half log half, which is minus half times 1 minus 1 plus minus half times minus 1. Let's put some brackets so that things are a little bit more. Uh, 
and basically you get one. So the entropy value is higher when you have exactly half the examples are plus and half the examples are minus. There's a sort of a nice intuitive way to think about this. You know, yeah, all I did was just plug it into an expression and it may not seem satisfying. The intuitive explanation for entropy is how many bits of information, suppose I have a probability distribution, how many bits of information are required to encode the information about that distribution? So um, the example that, um, uh, that always comes to mind for me when I want to think about it is, imagine that I have a weather station in Alaska, no, in Antarctica, let's say, somewhere where it's always cold. And that weather station has to send out one bit of information every day. Is it cold or is it not? Every day it's going to say it's cold. Now, how, there is no reason for it to send you that information because you know without the transmission that it's cold. How much information does it need to send in order to tell you about the weather in Antarctica? Zero. Because the probability of cold is always one. So essentially, if you have a probability distribution that is a near certainty or a certainty, there is no reason to convey any information because the answer is the, the information is already known to the recipient. On the other hand, imagine that uh, you have uh, some place in, uh, let's say, the, the Sahara Desert. And uh, the question is, is it hot during the middle of the day? The answer is yes. There's no reason to convey that information. There is no uncertainty there. So that's the key point. How much information is needed to convey uh, to a recipient about the, uh, you know, given the uncertainty in some uh, random variable. There is no uncertainty about the weather in Antarctica. There is no uncertainty about the weather in uh, the Sahara Desert. Imagine you're in a place where uh, half, exactly half the time it's hot, exactly half the time it's cold. At that point, it has to convey that information every day because, you know, you, there, it is fully uncertain. There is like perfect uncertainty there. Entropy is a measure of uncertainty, or it's a measure of uh, how much, uh, how many bits of information are needed to convey a certain signal. It's a measure of impurity in a data. Yes. Sorry, how is it? Ah, yes. If it is, it's less than one bit. It's on an average over a period of time. It, it's always in expectation. Yes. If, if, if the entropy, if the, let's say the probability of plus is 0 0.8 and the probability of minus is 0 0.2, then I don't, in expectation, I don't need to convey you, uh, convey all the information because 80% of the time you can guess the answer and you'll be right. If you like pictures rather than numbers, um, if you have, uh, you know, minus happening very, very infrequently and plus happening, you can uh, basically this, uh, these plots here show three different cases when minus happens very infrequently and plus happens more frequently, way more frequently, the entropy is small. If minus happens a little bit more frequently, then the entropy is a little more. If both of them are equal, the entropy is the highest. You can extend this to uh, multiple uh, cases, but the general intuition is that the uniform distribution has the highest entropy. Why? The uniform distribution is the one, is the distribution that is maximally uncertain. So uniform distribution has the highest entropy. So in these cases, I have, uh, it's not binary, but multi-class or multiple, uh, I should not be saying multi-class. In this case, it's a categorical distribution with uh, multiple possible, uh, with the support of multiple values. And the one, the distribution where there is most certainty has the lowest entropy, the distribution that is uniform has the highest entropy. And in this case, the entropy is more than one. More than one bit is necessary to convey information about that piece of, uh, 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 convey information about that random variable. So the, the lesson here is higher entropy is a way of quantifying higher uncertainty, lower entropy quantifies Lower uncertainty. Questions?
I'm not going to go into any more detail about entropy uh, and information theory. If this sort of stuff seems exciting to you, I strongly recommend uh, studying or looking up information theory. Uh, the textbook of Cover and Thomas is literally the best book in that in the topic, and you can you should look it up if you are interested. In fact, there's also another uh, uh, another completely different way to teach machine learning by presenting it as der being derived from information theory in its entirety. And uh, uh, David Mackay has a book on that does that essentially treats machine learning that way. Questions or comments about this? Yes. Um, I probably have. If not, can someone remind me afterwards? One of the TAs. Yes. Yeah. The reason I don't want to put it in the resources for um, the class is because I don't want to make it seem like you need to learn information theory to attend this class. So this is pretty much all I'm going to talk about entropy. Uh, you can, I, I, it's, it, this is a difficult concept to kind of sink in. So if you find this to be a little bit perturbing, give it time, play with some examples, you know, take some probability distributions, just compute the values. Uh, one thing you know for sure is if entropy, if your entropy that you compute is negative, you've made a mistake. The entropy is always positive. Um, and you kind of, I want you to kind of get this sort of a gut feeling for when the entropy is higher, when the entropy is lower. But essentially what the, the key point here is high uncertainty equals high entropy, low uncertainty is low entropy. Let's go back to uh, decision trees. Our goal is to pick a root attribute. And the way we do that is we want to choose an attribute that among all the attributes in the data reduces the label entropy the most. Let's see what that means. Uh, in fact, I'm going to oper Quinlan operationalize that idea into this uh, heuristic called an information gain. Information gain is a property of a particular feature. So you're given a certain feature in the data set and a data set, and you can calculate the information gain for that feature. The information gain for that uh, feature and data set is simply, first of all, you compute what is the entropy of the entire data set. When I say the entropy of the data set, I mean the entropy of the label in that data set. So you can calculate the entropy. And then for every value that the feature takes, you have, you have a subset of the data, right? So SV is the example where feature, uh, I'm, I'm not, it, it might be faster for me to say it than to write. SV is a subset of all the examples in S where the feature A takes the value B. So SV is still a data set. I can still compute its entropy. So the information gain is asking from the original entropy of the data, how much did splitting the data into these sort of partitions reduce the entropy? So for every partition, you can compute its entropy and weigh, uh, you know, weighted by how, how many examples have that partition, take the weighted sum. And the difference gives you the amount of disorder, amount of uncertainty that's taken away from the system, from the data, original data set, if you split on that feature. Um, if you have, we will see some examples, but essentially, if you partition, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 if, if the, each partition is assigned a weight here of how many examples there are. So if you have a if you have a SV with exactly one example, it is less important uh, than if you have an SV with uh, thousands of examples or a big fraction of the examples. So partitions of low energy lead to high uh, low entropy lead to high information gain. Now, what the the the, in, the way to employ this heuristic is to now compute this value for every single feature and then pick the feature that has the highest information gain. As an exercise, I want you to go back to that example with A and B, those two features, for both cases where you have three examples and where you have zero examples for that, that uh, third row and compute the information gain. Um, what I want to do instead though, is actually instantiate this idea for 
the tennis data set. I want to work through an example of computing the information gain because uh, um, if you have not seen this before, it's a little kind of tricky. So let's actually work through an example. So just to remind you, this was a data set uh, that Quinlan collected with uh, 14 rows and our goal is to find the root of the decision tree. So the entropy for the entire data set is, um, well, we need to know what's the probability of the positive and negative examples, um, or here I, just to confuse you, I used P and N. Uh, P is the number fraction of positive examples, N is the fraction of negative examples. So you have nine out of the 14 examples are high. So you have uh, nine out of the 14 examples are uh, positive and five out of them are negative. So you have these, um, um, these are the P plus and P minus if you want. I can compute the entropy. So entropy is minus 914 times log two minus 9514 times log two of that. If you work through the math, you'll find that the entropy is 0.94. This is essentially saying, um, the num uh, the this is a rather almost close to balanced set. So uh, it given no information, you can't tell upfront whether the label is going to be plus or minus. Why? Because the entropy is close to one. One is the highest value of entropy that you can get if you have exactly two labels. Not true if you have more than two labels, but with two options, you have the highest entropy possible is one. So this is saying the entropy of the labels in the original data is somewhat high. Okay, now let's compute the information gain. We need to go one feature at a time. Let's start with Outlook, which means we're going to look at that column there. Was there a question? No. So I, I'm going to essentially go through this process mechanically, um, just applying the idea that we saw, mostly because I want to kind of let it uh, kind of sink in. So the feature outlook can take three values and we need to consider each one of them separately. When outlook is sunny, we only consider these five examples. Now, among those five examples, there are three of them that are negative. So three fifths of them is negative and two of them are positive. So two fifths of them are positive. I can compute the entropy of this distribution and uh, you can also compute it. And if you do, hopefully you agree with me. Uh, the entropy of that is 0.97. So essentially when you split on outlook, the remaining uncertainty for examples where the, the outlook value is sunny is 0.97. Next, we need to look at the case where you have uh, overcast and we, uh, we kind of luck out here. There is the P plus, the, the fraction of positive examples is one. There are no negative examples. This is a certainty. When the outlook is uh, overcast, we always play tennis. I don't need any, you know, I don't need to consider anything, any other piece of information when the outlook is overcast. I know the name, which means the entropy is zero because it's a certainty. So maximally certain, so the entropy is zero. The third case is when outlook is rainy. So we need to consider these rows and repeat the process. We'll find that when it's rainy, there are three fifths and two fifths again, um, and the entropy is 0.97. So the expected entropy, when you split on these labels is in five out of the 14 cases, there are five examples here. In five out of the 14 cases, the entropy is 0.97. In four out of the 14 cases, the entropy is zero. And in five fourteenth again, the entropy is 0.97. So the expected entropy is the weighted average of these three things. So you get 0.69. So originally, in the original data set, before we split on this particular feature, the, the entropy was 0.94. After splitting on the feature, the entropy went down to 0.69. So the gain that we get by splitting is 0.26. This is the information gain for this particular feature, for one feature. Before we move on, any questions? Let me assure you, I will not be working to this level of numerical detail for all the learning algorithms because we'll end up having to have like a semester that lasts four years. But yes, 
Oh, when you expect the entropy always to be less than the previous, like, like the 0 0.9, uh -huh. first, will that guarantee be bigger than the second? Like, you know, always guarantee to be zero. Uh, I will leave that as an exercise for you. That's an excellent question. It's, it's a fun question to think about. Uh, so I'm the, the question was, will the expect will this number always be less than this number? That way your information gain is always positive. I will leave that as an exercise because it's kind of fun to think about. Other questions? This is a rather tedious process. One of the worst things to do in a classroom is to watch someone else do math. <laughs> okay? So I'm not going to go through this for every feature. So you can just kind of do the same process again and again. For other features, you can do this for humidity, you'll get the whole thing, and you get an expected entropy of 0.78. Last time, the expected entropy was uh, something else, right? Uh, 0.6. Six nine. Um, for, hum for humidity, the expected entropy is 0.78, but we shouldn't rejoice because the higher number means the information gain is going to be lower. Because how much information, even after splitting on that feature, there is still that much uncertainty left. Does that make sense? So after splitting on humidity, the amount of uncertainty, the expected uncertainty that remains is 0.78. After split, splitting on the other feature, the expected uncertainty that remains is 0.6 something. So the information gain for this is 0 0.515. And you can do the same thing for wind and temperature. And you get, essentially, for every feature, you get a score. The score is the information gain. The best feature to split on is the one that takes away the most uh, uncertainty. The one that takes away the most un uncertainty is the one that will have the highest information gain. In this case, it's Outlook. So after this entire process, the decision is to split on Outlook. And that answers the question that you asked quite a while back. How do you know what's the best? The ID3 heuristic gives a certain, makes a certain preference. This is not necessarily guaranteed to give you the smallest tree. It gives you a certain preference. So you can split on, heurist, uh, on Outlook. And then we know that Outlook can take three values. So we create these three possible branches. And now we are left with partitions of the data where uh, you know only a subset of the examples show up. If you split on the when Outlook takes the value sunny, these rows from the table are relevant. When Outlook takes the value overcast, these rows are relevant. And for rain, these rows are relevant. And we can essentially look at that subset of the data and give it back to IT. And give it back to ID3 and ask it to produce a tree using that subset alone and attach it here and here. In this case, we don't need to worry about anything. We are in that uh, base case for the recursion. If all the examples have the same label, don't even bother looking at the features. Just say yes or plus. Should we play tennis when it's overcast? Yes, I don't need to look at the wind and the whatever the other things are. And we keep continuing. Till we have run out of features, in which case we just pick the most common label, or we every uh, every example uh, uh, is has the same label, like in this case. We keep iterating till we hit the base case. Just to kind of keep going. Oh, uh, yes, question. So, if you see the next features. So let's look at this uh, case here. Let's say that the, uh, ah, I see. Would you leave out the overcast? Overcast doesn't exist here. So outlook is sunny in this case. So we look at the subset of the examples where outlook is sunny. This feature tells you, gives you no information about whether you should play or tennis or not, because outlook is always sunny. In some cases you play, some cases you don't. So we only look at the remaining features. When we go down this path. Yeah, that's probably a question, right? Yeah. And there were a couple of you who kind of gave me hints about should we split that, should we find the decision, the root of the tree according to uh, this idea or that idea. And hopefully, this, what I just said, aligns with or kind of clarifies your initial intuitions. 
Anyway, so if you keep going down this path, you'll find that uh, the best, next best thing to split on is humidity. You need to com compute the information gain of all these three things with respect to these labels. And it just so happens that humidity is the right thing to do here and wind, and you're done. At this point, you're, uh, you've completed building the thing. Thoughts, questions? Yes. The, the, what do you mean? I'm choosing the 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 label, not the label, the feature in this case that has the highest value of the information gain as the root node. Yes. So I need to split the data according to output. Just to kind of revisit the uh, whole thing. No, I'm not going to revisit the whole thing. I want you to go back and revisit it on your own. Just go back to the algorithm and uh, see if uh, at this point you should be able to implement the algorithm because all the uh, pieces are in place. Um, the We spoke about hypothesis spaces in the last lecture. And the hypothesis space that the ID3 algorithm searches over is the set of all possible decision trees. The set of all possible decision trees contains every Boolean function, which means, or in general, every discrete function can be written as a decision tree, which means we are searching over all discrete functions. Terrible idea, because there are so many of them. You can't. Instead, what the ID3 heuristic does is it's a greedy algorithm. It keeps, it builds the root and then keeps going down. It doesn't go back and say, you know what? After going down three steps, I, maybe my choice of root was wrong. Let me revisit this thing. No, it just builds the root, keeps going down, and greedily constructs the tree from the top to the bottom. It never revisits a decision that it makes. If you had to find the best decision tree, that's the smallest, it's an intractable problem. So another sort of a perspective uh, to think about ID3 is, uh, uh, if you're familiar with it, it, you can think of it as doing hill climbing without backtracking. Um, another point to make here is that the ID3 algorithm at all points, every step along the way, it makes statistical decision using the entire set of the data that's available. It's not like it chooses a certain subset of the examples to make some decision and then a different subset. We will encounter other algorithms that at any point of time only operate on a subset of the example. So in the interest of time, uh, since there were a lot of good questions, I'm not going to pause for questions and quickly summarize where we are. We looked at what decision trees are. Uh, decision trees are these uh, hierarchical data structures that allow you to represent data. And we looked at uh, the question of how do we learn decision trees. And the, uh, the answer that we encountered was to use this heuristic called ID3. Um, it's a rather simple heuristic. If all examples have the same label, you're done. Just create a leaf node with that label. Otherwise, find the most informative feature, and the whole thing about uh, the algorithm is in this choice of most informative, and uh, split the data according to that particular feature, and then just keep recursion. The choice of entropy as the building block of this information gain is a design choice. Um, there are variants of that that we'll encounter a few times actually. In fact, th this is a good time to start uh, encountering some of those variants. We're going to talk about some extensions of this uh, the decision tree uh, algorithm, and I think we have ten minutes left, so maybe I'll be able to complete these three things today and leave the discussion for overfit about overfitting uh, to the start of the next lecture. So, information gain is defined using uh, entropy. Information gain is entropy of the data minus um, so this is really SV here, no S. So the important point is it's defined using this particular definition of entropy that goes up a couple of times. Why do we choose entropy? Because it's a measure of disorder. It's a measure of uncertainty. Turns out there are other measures of uncertainty out there. Um, there's something called the majority error. The most common, uh, if you decide to choose the label 
uh, given a data set, you just find the label that's most common and you ask, if I just stop growing the tree right here, on all the examples that don't have that majority label, I, the, the tree is going to make a mistake. What fraction of those examples are have the non-majority label? That's, it turns out, a measure of uh, uncertainty as well. Some of you may have heard of this thing called the Gini index. Uh, it shows up in social sciences more than anywhere else. Also a measure of uh, uncertainty. Um, and all of these essentially work like uh, entropy. So for example, if you had the majority error was, suppose you have a, da a data set that has 15 positive examples and five negative examples. The most common label there is uh, the positive. Which means if you decide to choose to predict the label plus for all 20 examples, you'll make a mistake on five of them. So the majority error is five out of 20, one fourth. And that number behaves very much like entropy. If you prefer proof by pictures to see that they all behave like entropy, um, the red curve here is a plot of the entropy function for uh, as a fraction as of the uh, positive examples. Entropy is low when there is certainty on either side. When all the examples are positive or all the examples are negative here or here, the entropy is zero. The entropy is highest when you uh, when you have complete uncertainty. Exactly 50% are uh, uh, positive and negative. The Gini index and the majority error are also functions of the same sort of shape. They, uh, they attain the maximum value right in the middle and they go down to zero at the edges. So each measure peaks when the uncertainty is the highest and they have the lowest value of zero when the uncertainty is the lowest. So you can use all of these like uh, as if they are entropy inside the uh, information gain definition. The reason I'm spending this much time on this is because uh, I think in your homework, maybe grad students only are asked, only grad students, right? For everyone, okay. For all of you are asked to uh, play with a different definition of, uh, you won't be asked to uh, you know, replace entropy with something else. Another function that kind of behaves in a similar way and to build a tree with that. Okay, um, the next sort of interesting question that comes up is sometimes your data does not have all the features. Maybe when you were collecting the data for uh, the tennis uh, playing example, on day eight, your humidity sensor failed. So you have no idea what the humidity was. It can happen, you know, you can collect data and sometimes you have some examples that are not complete. This is a, uh, this kind of breaks the whole thing, right? I mean, how do you compute entropy now? How do, which, you can't compute entropy for this uh, feature because you don't know what the value of how, which way that particular example will go. Will it go on the high side or normal side? This problem is called missing feature imputation. Um, and any thoughts? How do you handle this during training? Yes. Which means in this case, hi. hi. So you just say hi because you know I have five examples. Three out of well, one of them is missing, so I can't use that. But three out of the four remaining has the value high, so I'll just tweak that example. Did you have something else? And then what do you do? Oh, I see. So you create a new, new, new category called question mark. And that could work, except you might end up sort of partitioning your data in funny ways. Because you're essentially saying this is, you're treating unknown as if it was high and normal. And sometimes it works, but it, it, you should be careful with doing that because you might introduce some extra assumptions into your data that may not be supported. Uh, yes. Um, if you are lucky, you can do that. If you have a lot of data, then you can do that. But uh, it almost feels like, you know, asking me to ignore a, a labeled example is like asking me to chop off a limb. 
uh, feels hard because sometimes labeled examples are so expensive to get that uh, I don't want to do that. But you know, if you have the luxury of having a lot of data, yeah, I mean, don't have to think about it, just talk it out. Yes. Can you uh, run an example for each different, like, assume it's high in one case and assume it's normal in another case? What are the two cases? Uh, what do you, you do with that? You just the line of data ah. and for the missing information, you just. So you create 8A and 8B, where 8A has sunny, mild, high, weak, and 8B has sunny, mild, normal, weak. Mm -hmm. So you create those two examples. Yeah. Uh, you have to be careful with that because you might end up biasing your uh, data points because you might end up introducing additional no labels, right? So you might change the entropies. So you have to be careful with that. You could do that, but those rows have to get lower weight. Or, you know, you have to essentially, they should get weights that are equal to one. Uh, yes. Ah, that's nice. This is so I see sunny and mild here and sunny and mild, and it seems like it should be normal because using the other features, you essentially say that you are essentially, huh, what you have done here is to create a new learning problem of using the other features to predict. <laughs> right? that, that's really literally what it is, which is actually done. It, it, it's doable, except you have to be a little bit careful that you, you know, what if the, some features are missing for that other learning problem? <laughs> so you have to be careful with that, but that's actually a rather uh, clever way of hand, uh, handling the situation. Um, yes. Yeah, so can you say that we have 3.55 1.5 so you want 3.5 high and 1.5 but where do you get the 0.5s uh it's just uh, it's why, why not just say three out of four high and one out of four normal oh yeah that's which essentially you're way you're duplicating the rows but adding some weights yeah. last suggestion take the uh, data from the the so on day eight, maybe the weather is going to be like day nine. So might as well use that. There you're using extra information about the data that in this case we have, but sometimes we don't. All of these are fantastic suggestions, by the way. Um, there are some sort of easy strategies for completing the data. The most easy strategy is the, uh, the in some sense, the most obvious thing to do first, always. Just use the most common uh, value. Uh, why? Because you know, in the absence of anything else, uh, so there was a suggestion, try possible values and pick the better information gain out of the options. Um, that is, so, so, so the suggestion is try all possible values for that feature. So essentially you run, you create two copies of the data, one where the, the value is high, another case where the value is low, and you find the one that has the best, uh, highest, better information gain for the humidity feature. That's a complicated but somewhat reasonable uh, strategy that makes certain kinds of assumptions. So, uh, in general, I prefer simpler strategies because it just, you know, somebody has to write the code for all this. Um, another uh, example that uh, nobody suggested is instead of looking at all of these, uh, the most common examples, you see that this row here has the label no. So you only look at the examples where the label is no and take the most common uh, example, uh, most common value. So in this case, also it turns out it's high, but you could imagine it could be, it could have been different. Had this been say yes, then you have to pick toss a coin. But uh, 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 this is what I'm saying. You only consider for computing the most common thing. You only consider examples where the label is the same. Uh, there were a couple of you who suggested essentially assigning some sort of weights to the uh, duplicating the rows and assigning weights to those rows. That's really what this is. You can think of uh, these as uh, fractional examples or fractional values of features, and there are some weights of it. What do you do at uh, test time? Okay, now you've built a tree. You have a tree, and now you need to make a prediction on an example. You're walking down the tree, you come to a feature, and that feature is missing. What do you do then? Well, you can do the same thing. 
you can use the default value and you can define default using this strategy, the most common feature among all the training data, or you could use default most common uh, value among examples with that label. So essentially you, for every feature, you have that particular default that you constructed from the training data and you apply the same search. All right. Um, I see that we are out of time, so I'll stop here. Um, on Tuesday, I'll pick up again. Don't forget to take a look at the homework. I think at this point, you have everything you need to do that. Right.